in Biblical Archaeology from the University of the Holy Land in Jerusalem. Uh, more closely related to us, he is the son-in-law of our church member Tom Cole. And so he is a family with us today. And so we are thrilled that they are here. He and his wife actually live over in Jordan. And he uh, spends much of his time uh, doing tours of Jordan and Israel, uh, having a degree in archaeology. He is able to uh, go and share things well beyond what most of us uh, know or realize. And I think the best thing I can say about Joel is simply this today. He knows and loves his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and loves sharing how archaeology, the things that he's studied, show how Jesus Christ, our God, our Lord, uh, where he walked, what he did, and how he has shaped and influenced history so that all people, whether they are here in Norman, Oklahoma, or over in the Holy Land, or anywhere else on the face of the earth, can know about Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. So, Joel, come speak to us this morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Matt, for uh, the invitation to be here this morning. Um, my wife Kathy is here. I got a bunch of kinfolk here from my mom's side of the family, too. And so good to have them here and just uh, appreciate this opportunity. Um, on, the, on the drive down here this morning, my uh, father-in-law, Tom, was, uh, he was saying certain things, trying to comfort me. He was uh, basically saying a bunch of different things that, that, that was to communicate, Joel, you don't be nervous. Don't be nervous about coming and speaking this morning. And so I said to him, I said, well, when I'm done speaking this morning, I'm going to go back over to the Middle East where I live, and you're going to be here in this church, your church. So actually, it's uh, about what I'm going to be saying this morning. It's you that should be nervous. <laughs> okay, well, what I want to talk to you about this morning um, was requested. And so, uh, let's see. I, I, I was, uh, for a long time, I was a pastor where I learned to preach. And, uh, and then I went and studied in Jerusalem for 10 years, archaeology. And so I'm uh, kind of a preaching archaeologist, which is, by the way, a very, very small field. <laughs> and uh, so that's what we're going to be doing this morning, is uh, we're going to be looking at uh, some archaeology, actually one particular archaeological discovery, and then we're going to be drawing out the meaning of that and the profoundness of that using the Bible, God's Word. Okay, so... One archaeological discovery, and then we'll understand it through God's Word, the Bible. Um, the archaeology that I want to cover with you this morning, the discovery, was made way back in the 1950s. And uh, this discovery was made in a site called Solab. And Solab, in ancient times, was part of Egypt, ancient Egypt. But... Um, but now today, it's actually located in Sudan. And so uh, when they were excavating there, they were excavating a temple that had been built by a pharaoh by the name of Amenhotep III. And uh, there he had listed, and we'll be looking at this in more detail, but he listed out his foreign enemies. And what was discovered uh, on one of the pillars where he had done this is an inscription that mentions the name of the God of Israel, Yahweh. Okay, now, I want to be clear, uh, over the last 200 years through archaeology, there have been many inscriptions that have been discovered that, uh, that have the name Yahweh in them. Multiple ones. However, this one is very significant because it is the oldest inscription ever found that has the name of the God of Israel, Yahweh. Now let's just talk a little bit about uh, the name Yahweh. Sometimes you'll see the um, name Yahweh called the Tetragrammaton, and don't let that, don't stumble on that. That's just a Greek uh, term that says four letters, because in Hebrew, the name Yahweh is made up of the four Hebrew letters, Yod, He, Wow, He, and so, uh, because of a long-standing tradition, uh, Jews have considered the name of their God 
um, too sacred to pronounce. And so if they're reading through in Hebrew and they see those four letters, yod Hey wow Hey, then instead of pronouncing it as it's pronounced, instead of them saying Yahweh, instead they say the title Lord, Adonai. Okay, and so... Um, so they read it, they're familiar with the name, they see it all the time in their reading, they just don't say it, they just don't pronounce it, they say instead, Lord. And so most of the Bible translators, when translating into English, into our English Bibles, they honor that long-standing Jewish tradition, and therefore they don't uh, translate the name Yahweh in our English Bibles most often, but usually they translate it as Lord, but to distinguish it from Adonai, Adonai which is Lord, they, uh, they put it all in capital letters. So when you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your Bibles, you know that behind that, or at least now you know that behind that, is the name Yahweh. And that name appears in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, 6,823 times very significant. In other words, you're going to see that capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, 6,823 times in your English Old Testament. Okay, and so, uh, so we have a very significant name that was found in the archaeology uh, at Solib. Now, I want to uh, cover what, how it is that, that I learned about this uh, this inscription. Because you're not always taught these things, believe it or not, in archaeology class. Some of these most strongest evidences are just swept under the carpet and nobody talks about them. So I was reading a book by a, uh, an Egyptology, the archaeology in Egypt, Egyptology, uh, a secular Egyptologist named Donald Redford, and he has a well-known book, and I was just reading through that book, and we can advance to the next slide here, and I, I got to this quote and uh, so I'm just sitting there in my chair in my office, and I read this. It says, for a half century, this is, the, again, I want to remind you, this is not a, a Christian archaeologist. This is a secular archaeologist that's speaking, and he's speaking to other secular scholars. He says, for a half century, it has been generally admitted, he's talking about this Solab inscription, uh, that we have here the Tetragrammaton, the name of the Israelite God, Yahweh, and if this be the case, now listen to what he says, as it undoubtedly is. Uh, the passage constitutes a most precious indication of the whereabouts during, here's the date of this inscription, the late 15th century B.C. of the enclave revering this God. Okay, when I read this, I almost fell out of my chair. What? There is an inscription from the late 15th century B.C. that says Yahweh? You've got to be kidding me. Why haven't I been taught this in archaeology class? Another thing I want to stress of why I put this quote up here is I want to make this very, very clear. I'm not talking to you about an inscription that I found. I'm not, talking, I'm not giving you my translation of what that inscription says. This is agreed upon. This is understood within secular scholarship. I'm not telling you when it dates to. They're telling you when it dates to. Okay, so we have a late 15th century B.C. inscription that mentions the name of the God of Israel, Yahweh. Okay, now, first thing I did when I read this is I dropped that book and I took off and ran to the libraries in Jerusalem and started looking for the excavation reports of uh, Solab that took place back in the 1950s. We can look at the next slide here. And, uh, and so this is this, uh, this temple that was being excavated in the 1950s that had been built by the pharaoh, Amenhotep III. And, uh, and so if I turn this on here, I think I can point up here. So it's, it's this room right here that is the room that, uh, that Amenhotep III lists out his foreign enemies, and it's on this pillar right there. If we go to the next slide, and this is, uh, this is from the excavation report, and so um, this is the drawing of this inscription. 
so I don't want to get too technical or anything, but we just, let's just talk just a little bit about uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, because this is in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, this line that you see, this dash at the top up here, uh, is a hieroglyph that just means land. Okay, and then you've got three. You've got a bird, or you've got this weird one here, and then you've got a bird and a plant. These three hieroglyphs, um, each one of them have a phonetic sound like a letter, and it's, it, it sounds out the, the word shazu. Shazu is translated into English as nomads. Land of the nomads. And then you have four hieroglyphs. Uh, you have these two feathers that you see right here, this house hieroglyph, a noose, and a bird. The two feathers are the Y sound, the ya. The house is the H sound. The noose is the W, and then this is the way, the, um, the, the bird, the W-E sound. So together, these, sounding them out phonetically, say Yahweh. Land of the nomads of Yahweh. Nothing in archaeology establishes facts better than the finding of inscriptions. And so what does the finding, the discovery of this description, or this inscription, establish factually? Simply this. We know that at least, based on this inscription alone, we know that at least by the end of the 15th century B.C., one of the enemies of Egypt is a group of nomads who worship a god named Yahweh. The same name in this inscription that's found in the history of the Israelites, the Bible, the Old Testament, 6,823 times. Uh, so significant, so significant that I said to myself, okay, this I got to see for myself. <laughs> right? So the problem is I'm, I'm in Jerusalem, I'm, I, and I have my passport, and I've got, of course, Israel stamps and student uh, visa stamps all over my Israel passport, and you're not actually allowed to go to the Muslim country of Sudan with Israel on your passport. So what I did is I went to the American embassy in Jerusalem, and I asked for another passport, which they gave me. So now I have two passports. I felt very much like a spy. Uh, <laughs> Only, unlike a spy, I didn't know how to use two passports, so I left Israel with my old passport. I went to uh, the airport in Amman, Jordan, to catch a flight into Sudan. I walked up to the passport control Jordanian guy. I handed him my new passport. He, of course, opened it. I appeared out of thin air. There were no exit or entry stamps in my passport. It was completely blank. He flipped through it, and he goes, oh, yeah, give me your other passport. And so reluctantly, I gave him my other passport. He looked over that passport for a while. And then <laughs> this is what he said to me. He said, uh, so let me get this straight. You're wanting to go to Sudan and hide the fact that you live in Israel. And I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. And he said, okay. <laughs> Stamp my passport. <laughs> So off I go, and, uh, and next slide here shows that I was able to rent a four-wheel drive vehicle and a local driver because this trip was going to be both on-road and off-road, so we head out across the uh, Sahara Desert, boiling hot, and uh, the next slide shows us crossing the Nile River in a local ferry, and, uh, and the next one is us arriving on the other side, and the next slide shows uh, how we were, we were camping out in the desert. And so here is my sleeping arrangement. It's boiling hot, by the way, in the Sahara Desert. And so I'm sleeping right smack dab on the ground. This really doesn't have anything to do with anything, but I got to show you this next slide. This is a camel spider. <laughs> this thing is the size of my hand. Look at the fangs on that thing. And then if we go back to the other slide, imagine those things are running around with scorpions and I'm laying on the ground like this. So I uh, just want you to know... This wasn't vacation or anything like that. 
Okay, so if we uh, go past the camel spider, here we are at um, my destination. After three days of traveling, we finally get to the temple of Amenhotep III at Solab. And uh, the next slide shows, uh, this is the room right here with all of the inscriptions on these pillars that you see here. And then the next slide shows it in 1950. And so this room is divided in half. This is the southern side of it, and this is the northern side of it. And on the southern side, Amenhotep III lists out all his southern enemies. And on the northern side, he lists out all his northern enemies. So I'm just going to show you a few examples. If we go to the next slide, we'll uh, see some of the southern uh, enemies. And so each one of these is a, is a separate enemy of Egypt. You can see uh, because these are southern uh, enemies, their ethnicity is depicted as uh, African. Each foreign enemy is, uh, is shown as a prisoner of war with his arms bound behind his back. And then we have this shield-like uh, inscription called a cartouche, and this is, uh, this is where Amenhotep III identifies his enemy. Okay, if we go to the next one, we'll see uh, another one, African, uh, Southern. We go to the next one now. On the north side, you start seeing see the Semitic, these uh, beards. The enemies start having beards and are much more Semitic. The next one, again, a beard, and then these cartouches. And uh, look, see this, uh, this hieroglyph down here that looks kind of like a crown. This is uh, the hieroglyph for uh, city. So Amenhotep III is identifying some of his foreign enemies as nations, like Libya, for example, is on this list. And some of them he's identifying as city-states, the city that they come from. Many of the cities that we read about in our Bible are found on this list, like, for example, Megiddo or Ashkelon are two examples of that. Then the next slide is, uh, is the one that, um, that I'd come to find. I don't know why these slides are kind of crunched, uh, smashed down, but anyways, um, if you see this slide, do you see that there's kind of a white slash across the top of it here? Okay, I was horrified. I, I traveled all this way to see this inscription, and when I got here, the top of it had been scratched, and then one of the locals had written his name in Arabic across it. Actually, I should go like this. <laughs> written in Arabic across it. I mean, this is one of the most important archaeological discoveries of all time. It should be a feature display in one of the world's premier archaeological museums, and yet it's just sitting out here in the middle of nowhere and people are scribbling their names on it. Um, fortunately, the, the hieroglyphs that are underneath that scratch mark, are, you can still see them when you're there. And the name itself uh, is preserved. Looks just like the drawing from the 1950s. There's the two feathers right here. Here's the house hieroglyph. Here's the noose. And uh, it's kind of hard to see, but that's the bird's head and body and, and foot going down there. So... Um, we have this, uh, so there it was. So I stayed at this uh, temple for five days, um, photographing it and studying it and making sure I could get everything I needed to down because I don't know if this is going to be destroyed. I don't know if I'm ever going to be here again. And, uh, and so let's go to the next slide. And, uh, and actually, the next slide after that is Exodus chapter 3. So that, now we've talked, about, we've talked about the archaeological discovery itself and, and what it is and what it says and whatnot. Now let's do something uh, very important. Let's now go to the Bible to learn about the significance of this inscription. If you want to learn about an inscription that says Yahweh a good place to go would be to the word of Yahweh, <laughs> right? And to, uh, and to read and let God teach us about his name from the scripture that mentions it 6,823 times. That would be a good idea. Okay, so uh, one excellent passage is Exodus 3. This is the, uh, this is the encounter of Moses where, uh, of the burning bush. And God is appearing to Moses in the burning bush, and he's commissioning him to go down and speak to the Israelites. 
and the Israelites, uh, God is about to deliver the Israelites out of their slavery uh, in Egypt, uh, and he's about to make them his people. So Exodus chapter 3, Moses says this, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask him, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, now there's the there's Lord, all in capital letters, right? So that means that's the name in Hebrew, Yahweh. So Yahweh The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. What is his name forever? Yahweh. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. That's why I don't have any problem standing up here before you going Yahweh, 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 because it says right there, right, that this is the name that he is to be known by forever and from generation to generation. Now, just a few things from here, just a few simple things, is Yahweh, the name Yahweh, means I am. When God says his name, he says I am. It means I am. It's the to be verb in, in Hebrew, and it's, uh, it's showing he, I am the existent one. And, uh, and so that's what it means simply, is I am, and the name Yahweh is, uh, now, now, now let's ask the question, why is it important? Why does God say that he's to be known by the same name forever and from generation to generation? Well, one practical reason is that God is eternal, he's real, he's alive, and that's his name. <laughs> and he exists through all generations, and so we should call him by his name through all generations. But there's other uh, reasons as well that are really interesting, and the one I want to focus on this morning is I want you to picture the game of Survivor, right, on TV. I haven't watched it in years, but, but there's that game of Survivor. At the end of the show, there's only one Survivor, and everybody else gets snuffed out, right? And uh, this is what's going on throughout the scope of history amongst the nations and amongst the peoples on earth is uh, they are, there's this massive game of uh, survivor going on. And these peoples and these nations believe in gods. Usually they believe in many gods, right? But they have one main god. They have the one whom they believe in that is the king of all the other gods. And so they, uh, they, what happens over time is that these gods and these peoples disappear from history as history goes by, right? Here's how a false god dies. A people who believe in a false god, when it comes their hour of need and they're about to become extinct and they need their god to save them, because their god is false, he can't save them. And when he can't save them, they become extinct. And when they die as a people, guess what dies with them? Their belief in this false god. And that's why as history goes by, we see new gods created, right? New false gods created, and we see old ones just disappear. Disappear. One after another. And, um, and the gods, the main god of each people is their identity. If you say to me, uh, if you say to me the name of the god Dog, I automatically know you're talking about the Philistines. Or Chemosh, we're talking about the Moabites. Or uh, Kos, the Edomites. Or Moloch, the Canaanites. That's their identity and the gods that they worship and especially the most powerful god. Ashur, the Assyrians. Marduk, the Babylonians. Who, what people do you think of when I say Zeus? Yes, and what uh, people do you think of when I say Jupiter? Romans, because that's their king God. You see, it's their, it's their identity. And that is what, if we go back, if we go back a few slides here, let's go back a few slides. Look, that's what Amenhotep III is doing here. Amenhotep III has to identify who his enemies are. 
And so he's saying, okay, this enemy is this nation, the Libyans. This, this, uh, th these enemies are from these cities, Ashkelon and Megiddo. But what happens when he gets to a nomadic people? They're not a nation. He can't use the city they're from. They're nomads. They don't live in a city. So how does he identify them? He doesn't identify them by the name they have as a people, Israel. Rather, he identifies them by a more important name, a more significant name. He identifies them as the nomads that worship the God Yahweh. And if we go back to Exodus 3, that's what Moses is getting at here. He's saying, okay, I'm going to go down to the Israelites, and, and if you're going to free them, if you're, going to, if you're going to free them from their slavery in Egypt, then they're going to have an identity crisis. Right now, their identity is as slaves. If you free them, what is your name? Because if you make them your people, they will bear your name. What is it? It's I am. It's Yahweh. And this is going to be, this is my name, this is going to be their name, and they're to call me by this name from generation to generation. I'm to be known by this name forever. We've got it right in that inscription from 3,400 years ago, and we can follow it through history. Um, okay, if we, uh, well, let's not quite go. I want to give an example of this massive game of survivor now if you pay attention when you're going through the bible and you're reading th this game of survivor going on amongst the gods and the peoples is all over the place but just so that it sinks in a little bit for us uh, more this morning i want to go over one example and the example i want to use is the assyrians the assyrians are the first empire and man these guys are brutal <laughs> and they end nations. The Bible says that they end nations. They make nations that have existed for a long time extinct. You can see the list of nations and in inscriptions before the Assyrians and then after the Assyrians and all these nations that existed up to that point are no longer mentioned in the inscriptions, like by the Babylonians, for example. So the Assyrians are the most powerful army on earth. And so if we go from south to north, we have the kingdom of Judah in the 8th century B.C. And uh, the kingdom of Judah, the king is Hezekiah, and they worship the god Yahweh. And then to the north of them is the northern kingdom of Israel. They have betrayed Yahweh, their worship of Yahweh. They've set up these golden calves and they worship Baal. Uh, north of them is Aram, the nation of Aram, and uh, their king of the gods is Hadad. So here comes from north of them the Assyrian army, the most powerful army on earth, to end nations, and it's a simple question. Whose gods are real and whose gods are fake? Whose gods can deliver them from this most powerful army on earth? So the Assyrians come down, they attack Aram first. They have a systematic way of how they end a nation. They, they destroy every single fortified city in Aram down to its capital city, its head, which is Damascus. They put it under siege. Can Hadad save his people from the Assyrians? No. They breach the wall. They destroy the royal family, and that nation is erased from heaven, or from history. It's gone. Extinct. No more. <laughs> they attack the northern kingdom of Israel. They wipe out every single fortified city in Israel down to its capital city, Samaria. Can these golden calves set up by Jeroboam, can the, the Baals, can they, can they save uh, the northern kingdom of Israel from extinction? No. The wall is breached. And, uh, and the northern kingdom of Israel falls. It doesn't mean that the 12 tribes are gone. They run down south into the kingdom of Judah, but that's another story. But here comes now under the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, in 701 B.C., the invasion of Judah. 
And so they come into Judah, they destroy every single fortified city in Judah, down to the last two cities, the capital city, which of course is Jerusalem, and then the second most uh, powerful city in Judah, which is Lachish. And Lachish is about to fall. And Sennacherib sends a message up to the people of Jerusalem, which basically says, you're next. And so he sends it by way of his general, he sends it by way of a letter, but um, that's what I want to read through. Let's read through this message sent by Sennacherib to the people of Jerusalem, and uh, it's in Isaiah, it's the next slide, uh, in Isaiah you'll find it, in Second Chronicles you'll find it, but we're going to read it out of Second Kings 18, 32 through 35, it says this, uh, this is, again, Sennacherib speaking to the people on the wall through a general. They're sitting on the wall of Jerusalem. And he says, Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says, Yahweh will deliver us. Has the God, now listen to this question, has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? And everybody on that wall in Jerusalem knew the answer to that question was no. The Assyrians had brought to Jerusalem a perfect record. Every nation they went to make extinct became extinct. Every city they laid siege to, they took. Every one. He gives some examples. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Zephyrvaim, Hena, and Iva? Have you heard of these nations? Do you know the names of the gods of these nations? Why? Because they were made extinct by the Assyrians so long ago that unless you read this verse, you've just never heard of them before. Uh, have they rescued Samaria from my hand? No. No, 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 no. When these nations died, so too with them died their belief in these false gods that were false gods because they weren't able to save them. If you believe in a God that's not able to save, what good is that God? He's worthless. And these extinct nations served worthless gods that couldn't save them, and that's why they passed from history. Uh, who of all the gods of these countries, here it is, has been able to save his land from me. Now listen to this. How then can Yahweh deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Them some fighting words. <laughs> now let's look at what Hezekiah does. Hezekiah does, in this situation, the only thing he can. He is helpless, like all these other nations. He cannot himself deliver his people or himself. He is completely helpless. So what does he do in this threat of the most powerful army on earth? He prays. He prays. What else can you do? Let's, let's look at Hezekiah's prayer. It says, And Hezekiah prayed to Yahweh. Give ear, Yahweh, and hear. Open your eyes, Yahweh, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. Now listen to what he says. It is true, Yahweh, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. Why? For they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Yahweh, our God, deliver us from his hand. And here is why. So that all the kingdoms of earth may know that you alone, Yahweh, are God. The survivor, the living God, the one who is able to save. 
That was Hezekiah's prayer. The next slide is uh, Yahweh's response. The next slide says, That night the angel of Yahweh went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. Let me tell you something. That is Yahweh's salvation. That is salvation by grace. Hezekiah completely helpless. The Israelites in Jerusalem completely helpless. What can they do in their helplessness? Cry out to their living God. Save us. Show your realness and save us. Show the nations of the world that we worship the living God who is able to save. Then he saves them and they wake up in the morning and look at all the dead bodies and they're saved. That's Yahweh's salvation. The people didn't do it. God saved them. It was God's power that saved them. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Back to looking at this uh, inscription again. I want you to put it in my perspective. I'm, I'm here in Sudan. I'm looking at this inscription for almost a week. And uh, here it says the nomads of Yahweh from 3,400 plus years ago. When I'm done there, I go back to Jerusalem to my apartment, where right across from our apartment in Jerusalem is a synagogue where every Shabbat, every Saturday, every Sabbath, the Jews gather to that synagogue to study their scriptures, their Hebrew Bible, to worship uh, their God who was on that inscription 3,400 years ago. They're still worshiped, not just in Jerusalem, not just in Israel, but all over the world. Jews are still going to their synagogues to worship Yahweh. How is that possible? It's because the God who saved them once didn't just save them historically once, right? He didn't just save them from the Egyptians. He didn't just save them from Sennacherib and the Assyrians. He also saved them from Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. He also saved them from Haman and the Persians. He also saved them from the Greeks and the Seleucids like Antiochus Epiphanes IV. He also saved them again and again from the Romans and from the Nazis until we have the reality that they're here. He answered, Yahweh answered Hezekiah's prayer again and again and again to show the nations of earth that he is a living God who is able to save his people again and again. It's power. Wow. He is God and there is no other. Now, you see that the emphasis on whether a God is real is on their ability to save, and we have to uh, ask ourselves a very important question, which is the transition, actually, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And that question is, is how does Yahweh save? How does Yahweh save? Here's how he saves. Yahweh, the living God, the one living God, saves by coming down from heaven to earth and becoming a man and taking on a body of flesh and blood for the purpose of offering himself as the perfect sacrifice for sin so that people could be forgiven from, of their sin and be saved from slavery to sin. That's how Yahweh saves. There is a, uh, the Hebrew word for saves is shua. You can say that after me, shua. So if we say Yahweh shua, right? That means Yahweh saves. Say it with me, Yahweh shua. Yahweh saves. We can shorten that. Yahweh shua, Yahweh shua, Yeshua, Yeshua. Yeshua, then can, that name means Yahweh saves. Yeshua can be uh, then translated into Greek, Jesus, and then from Greek into English, Jesus. 
If we uh, translate it from Hebrew, it's Joshua. If it goes into Greek, Jesus, and then into English, it's Jesus. In other words, Joshua and Jesus are the same name. One is coming from the Hebrew in the Old Testament. The other one translated into English from the Greek in the New Testament. What does Jesus mean? It means Yahweh Shua. It means Yahweh saves. Uh, for example, if we look at Matthew 121, talking of Mary, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. And this is just one example, but in this case, if you look down at the NIV footnotes, it just says, Jesus is a Greek form of Joshua, which means the Lord, all in capitals, Yahweh saves. Now, if we just take the meaning of the word Jesus from the original language and plug it back into this verse, it makes perfect sense. Look at this. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Yahweh saves because he will save his people from their sins. We have in the Old Testament a name that dominates the Old Testament. It's the name of God, Yahweh. We have a name in the New Testament that dominates the New Testament. What is it? Which is the name of God and the name of the Messiah who comes to save us from our sins. Yahweh is eternal. He can't die. The way that he dies is he takes on a body of flesh and blood to offer uh, himself as the perfect sacrifice. Now, also, we've been going through this uh, game of survivor in the Old Testament, right? How do we know the false gods from uh, the real God? Well, one way is time will tell. Time will tell. Time will tell the real God from the false God. False gods from the real God. We can ask the same question in the New Testament. How do we know the real Messiah from the false messiahs? Well, time will tell. Time will tell which one is the real Messiah and which one is the false Messiah. And just as we use one example for the Assyrians in the Old Testament, I want to use one example from the New Testament of this game of Survivor as far as it goes with the Messiah. And uh, it's uh, Acts chapter 5. The disciples have been out. Some of the disciples have been out proclaiming the good news of who Jesus is. They've gotten in trouble. They've gotten arrested. They're before the Jewish leadership, the Sanhedrin. They're trying to figure out what to do with them. So if we go to the next slide, we'll read this. We get some wise advice from a Pharisee named Gamaliel. And, uh, and so let's read it out of Acts 5, 34 through 40. It says this, But a Pharisee named Gamaliel addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Now he gives us an example. Some time ago, Theodos appeared claiming to be somebody. What he was claiming to be was the Messiah. Okay, so we have this example of Theodos claiming to be the Messiah, and about 400 men rallied to him. He gets 400 men following him as their Messiah. Okay, well, what happened to, uh, to Theodos? He was killed. Well, what happened to his followers? All his followers were dispersed. Well, what happened to his claim to be the Messiah? And it all came to nothing. You see what happens to false messiahs and their claims over time? Then he gives us another example, another historical example. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. So now Judas the Galilean is claiming to be the Messiah. He's got followers. What happens to him? He too was killed. And all his followers were scattered and all his claims of Messiahship, being able to deliver the people, come to nothing, just like with Theodos. Okay, now, uh, Gamaliel says, therefore, in the present case, I advise you. What is the present case? What these men that are on trial? The present case is Jesus. Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, and these men that are on trial before the Sanhedrin are followers of Jesus. Listen to what he says. He says, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. Just like Theodos, just like Judas the Galilean, 
it will fail if it's of human origin. But it, if, if it is from God, in other words, if he really is the Messiah, then you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves, fight, you will only find yourselves fighting against God. And it says that his speech persuaded them and they let him go. Let's see what happens. Time will tell. Now, to me, this is an intriguing test when you look at historical sources because within 40 years of when Gamaliel said this and set up this test, within 40 years, we have an independent from the New Testament historical source in Flavius jo Josephus and his famous quote about Jesus. Okay, so we have Josephus, who is a Roman historian, who is a Jew from the priestly line, and we have Josephus giving an account of Jesus less than 40 years after this test that Gamaliel puts out here happens. So let's look at the next slide at Josephus, what he has to say. Again, I remind you as I'm reading this, I'm not reading from the New Testament, I'm reading an independent historical source we know what it says from all the different copies that have been preserved for it. And, uh, and so this is what Josephus says some 40 years after Gamaliel says this. He says, At this time there was a wise man called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. Many people among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. In other words, he had followers. He claimed to be the Messiah. And he had followers who followed him as the Messiah from both the Jews and the Gentile nations. Uh, what happened to Jesus? Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But, that's the key word there, but, those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. What happened to Theodos and Judas of Galilean did not happen to Jesus. When they were following Theodos and, and Judas of Galilean and he was killed, they stopped following him because they, you don't follow dead people. But here, when Jesus was crucified, they kept following him. Why? Well, Josephus himself reports what they reported. He says they reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. The disciples of Jesus kept following him after his crucifixion because they weren't following a dead Messiah. They were following a resurrected Messiah who was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah. This is Josephus talking. Accordingly, perhaps he was the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have reported wonders. Now listen to this. Listen to what he says. And the tribe of the Christians, so named after him, has not disappeared to this day. Josephus is amazed by that, by the way. And it's only been about 40 years since the time of Jesus. 40 years. And he's going, wow. The Christians are following Jesus as their Christ 40 years after his crucifixion. There must be some validity to his resurrection if that's still going on some 40 years later. But now, if you think about it, think about this. What would Gamaliel and Josephus think if they could see the tribe of Christians today, 2,000 years later? Not only has the tribe of Christian not disappeared over the last 2,000 years, but it has grown and grown and taken the message of who Jesus is as the Messiah and his resurrection to the remotest parts of the world. There's been so many false Christs over the years that have come to nothing. 
But when we look in the scope of human history, it is so obvious who Yahweh Shua is, who Yahweh saves is, that he is Jesus. Let's go to the next slide and just look one more time at this inscription. And, and just to help you, this again says, nomads of Yahweh, after all this, after 3,400 years, I want, I want you to think about this. Find me some place in the earth, some place on earth where people are gathering together, where the Philistines are gathering together to worship Dog. Or the Canaanites. Where on this earth are the Canaanites still getting together to worship Moloch? What happened to the Assyrians? Where are the Assyrians? Where do they get together and worship Marduk or the Babylonians? Where did they go? Where did, uh, where, where did their gods go? Where, where is Zeus? Where, who's worshiping Zeus? Who's worshiping Jupiter? See, they're all gone because they all lost. Because they weren't real, they couldn't save. And the ones who believe in them have long become extinct. But the name of Yahweh is the name that we come here to this morning in this place to worship. And the name Yahweh saves, Yahweh Shua, the name of the Messiah of God. What are we doing here? We're, we're here because Yahweh has saved us from our sins. And where once our identity was as sinners, enslaved to sin, now, since Jesus has saved us, our identity is His name. We bear the name of Jesus forever that's power man the bible is so rugged and so much today i see you know that people people like to make up their own gods don't they they like to make up their own gods that they're comfortable with but the terrible thing about it is on the day of crisis when they need those gods that they've made up to save them, they won't save them because they're not real. We want to follow, we want to believe in the God of history, the Messiah of history, who is the God of the Bible, Yahweh, and the Messiah of the Bible, Yahweh saves, Yeshua, Jesus. It is his name that is our identity forever. Amen? Amen. Lord, we just uh, pray. We're just in awe of you. We're in awe of your name. We're in awe of your power. We're in awe of your salvation. And, uh, and what a wonderful service, Lord, in the worship time and in your word to lift your name on high and, uh, and honor you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise and thanks. Amen. We want to give you a moment to respond to...